How many of you are familiar with uh, Norman Rockwell's paintings? <laughs> what, um, what does Norman Rockwell attempt to do in his art? Show regular everyday life. Show regular everyday life, yeah. Kind of uh, perfect American, right? Um, Norman Rockwell, I think, is um, a great painter. But I, I think there is some things that are a little bit problematic with him. And what I think is that this famous painting of one in particular, David, if you wouldn't mind flicking to the next slide. How many of you are familiar with that one? The family gathering, be it Thanksgiving or, or Christmas. Look at everybody's faces. Right? Look at Grandma and Grandma. Smile away. Grandma has you know, hair, every hair is in place. It's ideal. It's perfection, isn't it? You know? That's the, that is the ideal. I mean, that is, that is what we hope to achieve, isn't it? No? Well, I think, you know, there's some sense that, that when we hit the season, that we have this idealism about what it should be. But one of the problems that with, with this painting and with Rockwell in general, I think, is uh, the tendency to seek out the ideals. That, that we're, we're getting a message that it is the life of being ideal, of, of perfection in the first place. You know, we are being reminded that we need to find the ideal job or the ideal relationship or we have to have the ideal children. <laughs> <laughs> the ideal homes and the perfectly decorated uh, home for Christmas and so on. And I suspect our longing for the ideals is rooted in the desire to improve, to be always prepared to see the potential and to be the best person we could possibly be. Right? The difficulty is that this, I, this sense of idealism of seeking to be something else is, is fraught with ultimate failure. We all never seem to make it. And this is the image that uh, Rockwell has presented and uh, the image that uh, the advertisers had at Christmas time and so on and so forth. And, but I think what it does for us is it creates a sense of inadequacy. It can. And this is also one of the great challenges with the, the social media that I've spoken about this before, particularly Facebook. Because Facebook tends to have people, when we post things on Facebook, do you ever post your failures or those bad moments of the darkness, right? We tend to post stuff that we're enjoying, where life is great, where the great trips we've been on, or the great places we've been, or all these wonderful things we've created, or the ideal. We're creating the ideal. And I want you to be honest with yourself for a second. Have you ever looked at Facebook of friends and people you know, and you look at these trips they've had, or the, the decorations, do you ever get a little envious? Mm -hmm. yes. Right? How yeah. is it? I, hmm? yeah. mm -hmm. you, you get it, and then you say, like, why, why can't I do that? You know, why is not me? <laughs> it, 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 it sets us up for failure. Because like Norman Rockwell, we'll never achieve that idea. We'll never ever get there. So, just to change gears for a second. So we hear it today a couple of readings that are, are, are pretty dark. Pretty dark. It's, you know, like it, it, it referred to the one we heard from the writer, writer Mark, Mark's gospel is it's called a little apocalypse. Apocalypse. Death and destruction. But what Mark is is doing is that first of all, there's no mention in in Mark's uh, little apocalypse about the end of the world. And there's no indication of final judgment and there's no call to flee the day-to-day -day realities and obligations and responsibilities of life. All Mark's doing is, is, is reminding us of the promise that was made. The promise that the person of, of, of Jesus all will be well. All will be well. And what you can 
can notice in this particular passage, and I won't get into the new detail about it, but the outline is uh, uh, concludes the passage about evening, midnight, the cock crowing, and dawn. And it is identical to, to the same pattern of the markers that happened during the passion of Jesus, his death and his resurrection. Evening, darkness, cock crow, daylight. Hope. What Mark is doing is saying is he isn't pointing to future negativity and apocalypses, but rather the present reality that in the person of Jesus, through his death and through his re resurrection, everything changed. We didn't change. Everything else changed. That in our own reality that is less than ideal for us, there is something much greater and better. And that regardless of who we are in any given moment, we're okay. We're not going to be ideal. We're not going to be perfect. But that's okay. Because God still loves us the way we are. God accepts us, embraces us, and accepts us for who we know in here and present. Present time. For the longest time, Advent has been about what's coming up. That is, you know, get ready for Christmas, Christmas is coming, we prepare for the second coming, and so on and so forth. But what I would like to do through the season of Advent is to focus our attention on the here and now, the present reality of ourselves and our world. The present reality of ourselves and our world. And that through this time of Advent, we today, the word being awakened, we are awakened, will be awakened to things around us, to the people around us, the situations that we encounter, that we are presented with, that even though we, we ourselves might not be able to, to uh, find that ideal moment for ourselves, that there are things that we can do to ensure that others have opportunities. <laughs> And there are things that we can do in the midst of our blessings to ensure that others can find their lives improved in their state, in the state of being, uh, strengthened. So what my awakening is, in a very specific way, as we've been talking about, one of the focal, focal points for our season of Advent is around the whole concept of education. And I think for most of us, we, we all tend to take education for granted. That, that we, uh, living in this time and place, have access to some of the best educational uh, institutions on the planet. Most of us had wonderful education. Part of our, my awakening is understanding that there are people in our midst, in this province of Ontario, in this country of Canada, that are living in situations where their access to education is no better than like a third world. And those people generally are people who are of First Nations backgrounds. So with the help of our Little Eco Justice Committee and, and Susan Curran and others, we've identified that education is a focal point for First Nations children. Let me give you some statistics. Education in Canada falls under the provincial and territorial jurisdiction with the exception of education on reserves, which falls under federal jurisdictions. And yet, schools on reserves are underfunded by two to $3,000 per child. And unlike provincial schools, the federal government uh, provides zero dollars for libraries, zero dollars for computers or software or teacher training, zero dollars for extracurricular activities, zero dollars for second and third level services, and many First Nation schools in Canada are unsafe and uncomfortable. Health concerns in First Nation schools include overcrowding, extreme mold, high carbon dioxide levels, sewage fumes in schools, and students suffering from cold and frostbite. 
There was, back in 2008, 2009, a young woman, her name was Chen Kusachi. And she was a 15-year-old girl who was lobbying for safe and comfy schools and culturally-based education for First Nations children. She was from Attawapiskat First Nations in Ontario, and the school in her community was closed because of the diesel fuel spill, of a diesel fuel spill that contaminated the school grounds. And the school was left closed for over 10 years, and students were forced to learn in portables with no heat in the winter, not enough school supplies like books or computers, and Shannon recognized that it was not right that other Canadian children had safe and comfy schools when she and the children in her community did not. So she took action and inspired thousands of children to join her in a letter writing campaign to the government to ensure safe and comfy schools. <coughs> Tragically, in 2010, Shannon was killed in a car accident on her way home from school by a school officer, but her dream continues to live on. Her website is shannondreams.ca. So my awakening <coughs> is that we live in a world in which we will never be ideally perfected in God's image. That it is a journey. It is a journey that forces us to be confronted by issues both personally, uh, locally, and globally that are unacceptable. And this is one thing that I really truly believe is unacceptable in a nation like Canada. So what we're doing through the season of Advent is on the back table, there is a small Christmas tree. If you feel you are called to make a difference in your first nation child's life, there are little envelopes, you can put something in that and then hang a little ornament on the tree as a sign of the gift. And those gifts will go through to First Nations children through an organization called INSPIRE, I-N-E-S-P-I-R-E. -E. And Susan has made copies of, uh, of, uh, of uh, donation, hmm? donation farms. Donation farms on the, on the back, back, back of the bus. So through Advent, we are inspired and awakened the plights of many of you in our midst. And we are awakened to the reality that we are loved by God, regardless of where we are, who we are, whose we are, and the plights we each face. I hope we are inspired and awakened to new beginnings today. Thanks be to God.